Mining the Word, staying true to Scripture while applying it to my everyday life. Sarah Scantlin lived in Hutchinson, Kansas uh, for many years, and as she was just at the end of high school and almost ready to enter the community college, she went out with her friend Lori Shockley. And Lori and Sarah went into a bar, unfortunately not a great idea, but when they were done, they came out, and Lori tells the story later how she felt someone kind of yank her off to the side just as she heard this screech of brakes and this thud as her friend Sarah had been hit by a drunk driver, and Sarah's body went up in the air, and as it came back down, a car coming the other direction hit her in the head. In a kind of irony of ironies, Doug Doman, age 21, was in that car. He was the drunk guy, and in fact, a couple years earlier, he had fallen three stories in a construction accident at a summer job, hit his head, and ended up unconscious for a number of weeks. And finally, when he came out of his coma and went through a couple years of rehab, people he thought were his friends called him retarded, and he was so frustrated by this, he went to a bar and tried buying people drinks to get them sort of friendly with him as he felt so lonely and now after he'd had too much to drink he was at the wheel and he passed on his problem to Sarah by putting her into a coma and she was in such bad shape they had to airlift her all the way down to Wichita to a hospital and the situation was so dire eventually they went down in and did a lobotomy from part of the brain affecting speech and she lay in this coma herself for something like six weeks. Now media reports will make it look like she was in this coma for 20 years but actually as she lay in this hospital bed eventually she came to a point of recovery where she could go back to her home there in Hutchinson, Kansas. And it wasn't actually her home, it was a nursing home that she was in. And the days dragged into weeks, into months, and even when she came out of the coma proper, she just was slumped over there in her chair with her eyes with this glazed, dazed expression. They didn't even necessarily track with people at first. And the TV would play and she wouldn't make any response. They tried stuff. Over the years, they would even try, like, could you blink once for yes or blink twice for no, in different ways to communicate, but it just wasn't working, although they weren't sure. It seemed like maybe something was going on in there. This accident all happened way back in 1984. Meanwhile, Lori would visit at least once a week, and eventually Lori ended up moving off to another town, still in the same state. And she would come by and visit where possible and try to talk and express her love, but I mean, there was no sign, no indication that anything was being understood. And they wondered, does she know what we're saying? Does she not? Well, meanwhile, a new person that was working in this nursing home was handing out medications. And this person was Pat Rinkin. Now, Pat, one day they had some kind of party, and Pat came dressed like a clown. And people begin to say, hey, you missed your calling. I mean, you shouldn't just be passing out meds. You should be the activity director. So Pat began directing the activities, but she took special interest in several patients. I think it was four, including Sarah, who could not speak. And there was no evidence of any connection. But somehow Pat could see past the slumped bodies, the drool, the vacant stairs. And she would go and spend time with each one daily, gazing into Sarah's eyes, stroking her face. I love you. My name is Pat. Do you love Pat also? And she would put in these intense therapy sessions, even though she was not a trained speech therapist or a trained clinician. She had experience in other things, and now she just did what she could to try to call out any responsiveness, any awakeness. And as more time went by, at one point, I think a year later, Sarah began occasionally to let out a scream, just, ah! And it was disturbing to hear her scream, but for those who knew that she had gone on for years from 1984, from the accident until 2005, There was no kind of response that really showed, although her charts, medical charts, indicated she seemed alert, but she was not able to communicate anything back. 
but now at least there'd be the occasional scream, and so Pat increased her intensive attempts to get some communication happening. And finally, by 2004, uh, there was a little bit of a hint, like maybe she's catching on to something, and by 2005, she, that is Sarah, actually began to speak a few words, and then eventually she began to communicate with great difficulty, because remember it was the speech processing center of her brain that had been harmed and even one section removed back after the accident. So apparently her brain was recruiting new sections to do old tasks. And when they began to ask her questions, she would remember things that had happened, for example, 911 and buildings had planes crash in them and stuff like that. But she thought she was still 18, even though she had gone on another 20 years. She was 38 instead of 18. And she finally conceded she must be about 22 anyway, and she wondered why everyone was getting older around her and she was still 18, or maybe 22. She eventually died in 2016 when she was 50. Now Sarah was trapped in her body. They discovered she actually could hear long before she was able to talk and had no way to communicate until the brain could recruit new sections to learn speech patterns. but. Even when we have strong, active, vigorous bodies, we can find ourselves trapped through other means, through other things that have come into our experience. Let's take a look at how this happened in the life of Joseph in Genesis 39, but first let's pause to pray. Lord God, please guide as we pause to reflect on your word that we'll see what's in it for us, what we need to follow, and how to be more Christ-like. In Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 39, verse 1. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. We see this is jumping across from the end of chapter 37. In between, there's chapter 38 that had all that messy stuff about Joseph's brother Judah, the very one who had sold Joseph into slavery. We've already looked at that. It could be interesting if you want to back up and go back a number of weeks ago when we looked at Genesis 38 under the title, The Finger Points Back. But for now, he's been purchased by the captain of the guard, the executioner possibly, the Tibachim, they were the executioners or the elite or kind of brutal bodyguards. But come down to verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph and he was a successful man and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. I want to pause, and as we go through this chapter, there is a key word that pops up maybe a dozen times, and that word is house. And Moses seems to use this term to try to indicate what is going on with whom. And what was it called, first of all? Whose house? In verse 2, it was called the house of his master. So Joseph starts out acknowledging, I am caring for another man's stuff his home, his possessions, he acknowledged that. Verse 3, And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord had made all he did to prosper in his hand. Verse 4, So Joseph found favor in his sight and served him. Then he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had he put under his authority. Whose house? His house. So Moses, and in telling the story, Joseph also is indicating or acknowledging this is his house, my master's house, not mine, I take care of it. Verse 5, so it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake, and the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. So that we see whose house this time, we see the three expressions. His house, the Egyptian's house, the house. It's still acknowledging that man's in charge. But do you see the other thing, the great reality? The blessing of God came to this Egyptian because of Joseph. Even people who don't acknowledge God gain some benefit when they're around the people who do. And your life can be like that. You can bring blessing into the experience of people who don't yet believe what you believe just by connecting with the Lord and connecting with these people. Verse 6, Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Yfe tuar, translated handsome in form. Yfe mar'e, which is translated here as uh, handsome in appearance. 
Joseph was one handsome person, but you notice that language is not new in Genesis. His own mother, Rachel, was described as Yifat Teor. That's the same as one of those two expressions used for Joseph, just in the feminine form. She was also beautiful of form. And the other part of that sentence is used for her too, Yifat Mar'e. She was beautiful of appearance. The same expression, like mother, like son. She was beautiful, he was handsome, but more than that, it was also on his, uh, through his father's side. His grandmother, Rebecca, married to his father, Isaac, was described as tovat mar'e, beautiful to behold, or that would literally be good to behold. And so his mother and his father's mother, that is, his paternal grandmother, what about his great-grandmother, Sarah? It says, she was yifat mar'e, beautiful of countenance. So the same expression comes from the great-grandmother, grandmother, and even his mother, They all were these beautiful women, and he was handsome, which is fine, but that leads to a challenge. Sometimes in life, the things about us over which we don't really have so much control, uh, some of those can bring us some difficulty and opportunity. But notice the challenging opportunity or difficulty it brought. Verse 7, And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph, And she said, lie with me. Shikva emi, lie with me. She's enticing him, come, let's do something that would be so thrilling. But Joseph recognized this is not good, this is not right. Now notice how Moses, when he describes activities which are biologically similar but morally different, he chooses a little different vocabulary to express these things. A man would know his wife, but he would lie with a woman that he was not married to. Way back in chapter 4, verse 1, Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. Here it is, he knew her, she had a child, but notice what it says where there wasn't a marriage involved. Chapter 35, Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine. He lay with her. They were not husband and wife. And so there are some exceptions, but Moses is showing how when it's husband and wife, he'll say the husband knew his wife when it's just man and woman, They don't belong to each other while one lay with the other. And so that casts light on this business where she says, Shikvai me, lie with me. Something which is beautiful and holy in one context is sinful in another context. And the difference is the marriage vow. One man, one woman, according to the biblical pattern, married to each other, and that becomes a beautiful thing. But just two people that don't belong to each other in marriage, that's sinful. And Joseph recognized this. So notice what he does next, and it makes quite a difference. Verse 8, but he refused. He was resolute. Even Dan Ariely in his book, Predictably predictably Irrational, he shows how people, when temptation comes, and unfortunately he got permission to actually tempt people and watch what happened. I'm not getting into that now. But when temptation happened, he said there were just a couple seconds where the person had an opportunity to either resolutely do something different or find himself drawn into that set-up temptation. And so Joseph, first you see him standing vigorously. He refused and said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not... Wait, wait. My master, Adoni in Hebrew, my master. That's almost like Adonai, God in heaven, but this is the Lord on earth. I should say Adonai would be Lord in heaven, Adoni, my Lord on earth. He recognized there is a place of authority, of possession. You are the one who owns this, and I respect that. Look, my master does not know what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. Whose house? It's the house. Again and again, the house, this house, my master's house, it points at he's the one in charge, the one I call my Lord, Adoni. He's the one that has the right for me to respect. This belongs to you. And he has committed all that he has to my hand. There's trust involved. He trusts me. I cannot break his trust. There is no one greater in this house than I. What? Whose house? This house. It's still not mine. It's this house. Nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. Everything is under my control, but that's because he trusts me. I respect him. I honor his possession of all these matters. And yes, I manage them, but they are his, not mine. And he 
doesn't even concern himself with that. And the only thing I can't have my hands on is you. You are his wife. I have no right to you. But there's something even bigger than this that helped Joseph be strong. Something much more powerful at the end of verse 9. And in Hebrew, in their language, what he says next comes out as seven powerful words. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He wanted to keep everything to honor God. He did not want to misrepresent God in anything he said or did. I wish it could have ended there. But it goes on to verse 10. So it was, as she spoke to Joseph day by day, that he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. He did not listen to her. He did not heed her. And it was about two things, to lie with her. Imagine that overwhelming temptation. She's offering him excitement, offering him an opportunity to experience forbidden fruit, so to speak. Don't worry about it. I'll take care of everything. No, it's a setup. It's a trap, even if that's what she wants, even if it's what he wanted. But remember, he was resolute. He was fast in his determined avoidance. And it said what? He wouldn't even be with her. That's sometimes where the trouble starts. We think it's just a business kind of situation and we find our hearts getting bonded together as we playfully interact with each other. And there are safeguards that need to be set up to protect so that the bond between husband and wife is not somehow invaded by those outside. Yes, we can interact with people to whom we're not married, but there are ways to do it to prevent this sense that now... Your body belongs to me and my body belongs to you. No, that's only for the husband and wife. Verse 11, But it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work. What's it called? It's called the house. Three times in Hebrew, just two times in English, but when it talked about the men inside in Hebrew, it's inside the house. But let's read verse 11. But it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house was inside. There it is. The stage is set. It's sort of a trap, and maybe she intentionally designed it that way, arranging for these other people to be at different tasks, so finally she could be alone with Joseph. Verse 12, that she caught him by his garment, saying, Shikvai me, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand. It must have been an overwhelming temptation as a strong, healthy young male, and there she was, giving him an opportunity which he did not deserve or should not go for, And it could have drawn him into a terrible situation, but he avoided it through the power of God. But notice what he does instead. But he left his garment in her hand. You can almost imagine her standing there just kind of stunned, like, whoops, I've got this in my hand. And in fact, when you look at the Quran in the section, Yusuf, the section about this story of Joseph, a kind of brief surah, it talks about this trap. And as it talks about him getting away, The people are wondering, ah, okay, is her word true or his word? If her word is true, this coat is going to be torn in the front because he's attacking her. If his word is true, it's torn in the back. And then they hold up the coat and, ha ha, his word's true, it's torn in the back. So he's kind of exonerated. But then she sets up a different trap, not set in the Bible. But let's stick to the biblical story, which is not trying to clean everything up in a short time. In the Bible story, it's left unresolved for years. Like those years that Sarah lay in a bed and seemed unresponsive, Joseph would have years, including service as a slave and later time in a jail. But let's see what happened right next. He left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. Like Don Adrielli showed with the tests that he'd he conducted. Joseph just knew this instinctively. Don't hesitate. Don't think about what if and how might, you know, how might I possibly do this? No, get out of there. And it's such a contrast from his own father, his own father Jacob, when his mother had said, you know, uh, just tell this lie to your father so you get the blessing. He didn't say anything about, oh, this is wrong. No, he just said, well, my brother's a hairy man and I'm a smooth man, Genesis 27, 11. In other words, I might get caught. And even he said, I will seem to him to be a deceiver. Seem like one? You would be a deceiver if you did that. So instead of saying, I might get caught, look, your husband's the chief executioner, that could be bad. No, Joseph had only one concern, that one major concern, and that is, how can I dishonor God? And so it was when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled outside, that she called to the men of her house and 
Whose house? It's her house. Did you catch that change? Things are completely different now, and Moses used this subtle change of vocabulary to show that there's a drastic change in reality. So he simply changed which pronouns he used. Notice the pronouns that he'd used up until this point. It was the house of his master, his house, the Egyptian's house, the house, this house. But now there's a new pronoun in the text, her house. She called the men of her house and spoke to them, saying, See, he has brought into us a Hebrew to mock us. He came in to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. Wait, this story is being reframed. Instead of she's trying to lure him in and she cries out with a loud voice when he escapes, it's like he's coming after her and she cries out to save her own life or to save herself from being violated. When she could not receive what she desperately wanted, she reframed everything to try to hurt the one she so much had desired before. Don't fool yourself when, when it seems like people are willing to cover your tracks and to make things all disappear and be hidden, and you'll get away with it, they'll help you get away with it. Those exact same people will turn on you viciously. And even the devil who lays the temptations and sets the trap the same one does not let you fully enjoy what he sent you to taste and experience, but he will savagely turn on the victim of his temptations and try to abuse them and make their futures miserable. And so you can imagine that scream just, ah! So in verse 15, she continues with her explanation. And it happened when he heard that I lifted my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and fled and went outside. As you look at this, you notice one part is true and one part is false. Which part is true? He left his garment with me and fled and went outside. That's true. He left his garment with her and fled outside, to his credit. But the first part of this verse is a lie. When he heard that I lifted my voice and cried out, he did that. Really? That's not the way Moses told the story. Moses told that she screamed after he ran outside. He was getting away to keep himself pure. And she screamed because she failed. But she makes it look like he's attacking her, so she tells the truth and tells a lie and mixes them together. And so often in life with our politicians and even the people in our family and friends and people that sometimes even want to help us, when they try to get us to do something this way or not to do something that way, they'll often tell something that's true just to put the hook in to catch us and then mix with it something that's false. She wanted her husband to do what she needed done so that's where the truth came in, to catch him and draw him along. And then she put in the falsehood to make sure it went the direction she needed. Verse 16, so she kept his garment with her until his master came home. And then she spoke to him with words like these, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you brought to us came in to me to mock me. So it happened as I lifted my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and fled outside. It's the same thing. She's telling something false and she's mixing it with something true. He did flee and run outside, but he did that before she screamed because he wanted to be pure and holy. So it was when his master heard the words which his wife spoke to him, saying, your servant did to me after this manner, that his anger was aroused. He was so upset. He must deal with this person that, how can it be? I trusted you. I let you have such a great responsibility and you would do this? And yet, I find a hint that maybe he didn't fully believe his wife. He had seen her scheming and conniving. He had seen Joseph so transparent and so pure. And this action just seemed totally out of character with Joseph, but it seemed kind of in character with stuff he'd experienced with his own dear wife. Verse 20, then Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in the prison. Wait a minute, do you remember what this guy was way back at the top of the chapter? In verse 1, it says he's an Egyptian. This may have been a time of Hyksos occupation when it's kind of out of the ordinary for someone in government position to be Egyptian and outsiders were in for a while before they were booted out. But the other piece, it said that he was, in the New King James Version, captain of the guard. Sar Hadabachim. And the tabach is to slaughter that verb. These were the ones that uh, butchers had that title or also the guards that had to hack into people to save the one they're guarding or the chief executioner. 
that's Sar, the leader of the Tabachim, the uh, butcher, so to speak, he may have been the one in charge of all the executioners. And if that's the case, you would think it's quick, you know, one, two, three, my wife tells what you did wrong, I kill you, and three, we go back to life that's happy and we replace you. But he didn't execute Joseph. He put Joseph in prison under someone else's authority. So what happened next? Verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy, and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Isn't that awesome? When everything falls apart, even when there's no evidence, you can know God is with you. And when Yahweh was with Joseph, then there became some evidence. He received favor from the ones guarding him, from one in particular, the one in charge. Verse 22, And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. Wait, that's the same thing he had with Potiphar. So while he started as a slave and he ended up in charge of all of Potiphar's house, he starts now as a person thrown in a prison and he ends up in charge of all the prisoners. But notice this intriguing last piece of the sentence. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. This isn't the only place in scripture where it comes out like this. Other people are doing the actual tasks, but it's Joseph's doing. This is showing accountability. This is showing lines of authority, responsibility. You can't just wash your hands and say, well, it wasn't my hand that held the knife that slit her throat. If you're the one that said, do it, and somebody else did it, you did it. So this is showing responsibility. And so often politicians or family members, well, I didn't do it. But in the meantime, you instigated someone else to do it. You did it, according to this way Moses views Joseph's experience. But in this case, it's so positive. God's working through him. And when, because of you, somebody else goes out to share a testimony, you did it. That person's testimony is making it happen when you pray for that person. Lord, empower that person to win someone for Christ. You did it. Your prayers for that person are responsible for the work that person does. Verse 23, the keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him and whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. That's so exciting again. Whatever he did, God made it prosper. Yes, his life is falling apart, but God begins with plan B, plan C, plan D. He always turns it around and says, okay, there's a new problem. I'm with you. You'll get with this. You'll get through this. I want to go in reverse order and look at three ways that in this story, Joseph was able to overcome overwhelming temptation. So the third one is Joseph minded the pronouns. Yes, you see stuff like his house, the house, this house, his master's house. And all that stuff is a way to acknowledge this belongs to the other person. I am only a steward, a manager. It's his. He respected what belonged to the other person, and he was fine. And then we see that shift in verse 14 when it becomes her house. When the pronouns changed, other things changed. But in Joseph's head, he kept the pronouns right. The house, this house, his master's house, he would not accept her house. And that's the first thing. I'm sorry, I'm going in reverse order. That's the third thing. We need to recognize when someone is laying a temptation for us and Joseph minding the pronouns was Joseph recognizing where temptation is being laid for him. It's his house, but you want it to be her house. And that's where it becomes a trap. He minded the pronouns. And secondly, Joseph was recognizing the Lord of the house, the other knee, my Lord, my master, the one in charge. It belongs to him. He has the right to ownership. And as long as I respect that and honor that, it helps to prevent me from a temptation. How can I do this with you? You don't belong to me. You belong to him. And so often when people are tempted, if they could only think, this person is not mine, even if it's on an internet site or in a magazine or whatever, she belongs to someone else. She isn't mine. I have no right to her. And that second protective layer can help to keep a person from running down that path. Now, we happen to be looking at something involving the potential for sexual sin, but it could also come in place with other kinds of sin, gossip and lying or cheating on taxes or whatever the case may be, ab absolute harm, doing things to people, and you recognize, no, that belongs to you, not me. And there's that protective barrier. But the number one thing the most important thing in this whole chapter would be verse 9. 
Joseph refused to do anything that would dishonor God. Remember those seven words in his language? How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And what was the result? Verse 21, the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy. Mercy. Chesed. Chesed is that covenant relationship between two individuals. And when someone shows that covenant relationship positively, we say he showed chesed. And it could be translated mercy, loving kindness, etc. God was working on his behalf. He gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hands all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. God gives you more responsibility when you show that God can trust you with more responsibility. As Jesus would say centuries later, to whom much is given, much is expected. So I have an appeal in the same reverse order as those three things that Joseph did. Mind the pronouns in your life. Recognize where temptation is being laid. And when you recognize it, don't sort of fiddle around with it. Get away as quickly as possible. And number two, recognize the Lord of the situation, the Adoni, the master. There's a line of connection for possessions, for respect to say, that's yours, it's not mine. I preserve what belongs to you and I don't tamper with it. And that's another protective layer. But most importantly, the first one is refuse to do anything that would bring dishonor to God. Like those classic words of Joseph. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So whose house is it? Your house or his house? When you are a steward in his house, he gives you the power to make the right choices and to live the right actions. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for helping Joseph to be faithful so many millennia ago. Help us to be faithful. Guide us so that we will be equally protective of what belongs to you, what belongs to others, and fill us with your power like you did Joseph, because we know we cannot do these things on our own. Thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a blessed day, and God be with you as you continue mining the word and living for him.